Our resurrection sermon this morning will be out of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, a very important foundational chapter that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about the resurrection, specifically Christ's resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look in verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I want to preach on God's answer. God's answer. Oftentimes men, they go through this uh, period of life, even as Christian men and women, we remain with this mindset, this childlike mindset of questioning everything and of even questioning God. It's kind of like the man who brought the young boy to Jesus and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. We believe the Bible. We know what God says. We know there's a resurrection. We know we'll see our loved ones. However, there seems to be a black cloud of sin and sickness and sorrow and suffering and death on the horizon. And the oppression of the sickness and death in our lives and what we have experienced with the results of sin and sorrow, sometimes they're too much than we can bear, and we need to be reminded God has answered man's questions. And that's really what oftentimes skeptics and agnostics bring to the table. They say, what about the suffering in the world? What about all the graves? What about all the children who've died? Where is your moral God with all of these seeming immoral circumstances in our world today? And so the mind, if it's not careful, especially even the Christian mind, if it's not careful, it will reflect back on those unregenerated doubts and skepticisms instead of saying, okay, God has the final answer. In 1 Corinthians 15, we do have the final answer. And I really appreciate the fact that Paul wrote this by God's direction because he explains a lot of things for us as believers that we can apply and get an understanding about what has happened with Christ and what is going to happen because of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, you'll notice in verse number 3 where people most of the time stop, it says Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. They say there's a place over in the Swiss Alps, or the, the Italian Alps, I'm sorry, where they have this place where you can walk and you can take a journey uh, to the stations of the cross. And they come to this place, each station leads to another um, forthcoming event in Christ's life, and you finally get to the place that culminates with the cross. And people come and they stand and they see the cross. There was someone visiting one time and they saw that it seemed like there was a, a trail kind of already grown over that led beyond that. So they went beyond a little ways and there was a lot of brush and things grown up and you could hardly get through the trail. But as they walked, they realized the trail led around to another station after the cross. And it was a shrine that depicted the empty tomb. A lot of times, even as Christians, we stay at the crucifixion. We stay at the cross. We stay at a place of death. And might I say, a place where your sins were put on Jesus Christ. But that's not the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. The rest of the story is Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, God's answer to that ominous cloud of death and that awful sickness in your stomach that death is coming, that death has taken your loved ones, that death is going to get you, God's answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have to be reminded that God has spoken and God has given us an answer. It is the hinge upon which Christianity is built the pivoting point of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice Paul's argument as he develops this in verse number 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, 
How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The persuading point of our preaching, verse number 14, is the resurrection. The anchoring link of our faith, verse 14, is the resurrection. Verse 15, the silent witness of our testimony is the resurrection. There were two skeptics and they knew this uh, man was a Christian. And he was very vocal about his faith. And they said uh, to the man one day, just kind of off the cuff, they said, uh, how in the world can you be sure that Jesus Christ is alive? He said, oh, that's easy. I just got done talking with him. Jesus Christ is alive. If you're saved by the grace of God, you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is alive because there's a silent witness of our testimony. He is inside of us. And then there's the finalizing act of our redemption, verse number 17. That's the resurrection. It's the finalizing act of our redemption. Romans chapter number 4 says, He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. He stood in front of God and said, it's done, it's finished. He said it was finished on the cross. He showed that it was finished when he rose again from the dead. He paid for our sins on the cross. He delivered the payment to God when he rose again from the dead. He delivered for our justification. He was risen again for our justification. We are justified in the sight of God because Jesus Christ stood in front of the Father. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's answer to that. But it's also verses 18 and 19, the sustaining hope of life itself. Without the resurrection, we are miserable. Without the resurrection, you are mean. You are wicked. You have no hope in this life of ever getting any better as a Christian. You have no hope of this life after this life of seeing your loved ones that have gone on, of being able to be outside of hell and into heaven. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. And so the pivoting point is the resurrection. Now I want us to look at just... Three things about God's answer. God does give an answer. Thank God He does. I want you to notice in verses 20 to 28 the promise of resurrection. In verse number 20, Paul says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The promise of resurrection. Notice in verse number 21, the origin of resurrection is man. Notice verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. We got into this trouble not just because of Eve. And I know you men want to blame the women all the time. Well, if Eve wasn't have messed up, we wouldn't have messed up. Don't be so quick to blame the woman. Because the woman, the Bible says, was deceived being in the transgression. But Adam made a willful choice to say no to God and yes to his wife. 
And Adam, as the federal head of the human race, bore the responsibility. That's why Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, not by one woman. So quit blaming Eve. By man came death. Now let's just think about it real simply. Your problem is not because of God, it's because of you. You say, well, I didn't mess up. Adam's the one that messed up. And we know Romans chapter 5 talks about those who haven't sinned even after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Yeah, there's a problem. But here's the thing. When you are presented with sin, you say yes instead of no more times than not. Quit blaming God. God has an answer for your skepticism. God has an answer for your agnosticism. And God has an answer for your rebellion. You say, what's his answer? His answer is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He experienced and he all-encompassed suffering for you and for me. And he rose again from the dead, conquering the biggest problem we have in life, which is death. That ominous black cloud, that foreboding sense of knowing all good things must come to an end. Isn't that the same? It doesn't have to end bad. It can end well. Paul said at the end of his life, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He was looking forward to something after he crossed over the valley of the shadow of death. And for a believer in Jesus Christ, death is the climactic experience of the Christian life. Crossing over that Jordan River into heaven itself. The power of the resurrection, notice the promise of the resurrection. Verse, verses 20 and 21 and 22, it tells us that it came from man. It came from, from, uh, from Adam, but it says also it came, the resurrection also came from man. So by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, thank God he was God and is God. But Jesus Christ is also man. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is 100% God and he's 100% man. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. God can't die. Jesus Christ died. God can't be hungry. Jesus Christ was hungry. God can't be tired. Jesus Christ got tired. And Jesus Christ suffered and he bled and he died. But God can't be raised from the dead either. But Jesus Christ died so he could be raised again from the dead. By man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. Whatever man has messed up, God can make right. Whatever man has ruined, God can restore. No matter how big your sin is, God's grace is bigger. No matter how bad your guilt is, God's grace is better and can overpower that. And the Bible teaches us and exhorts us and encourages us to fall back on the grace of Almighty God. He says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Before hell was, heaven was. Before sin was, righteousness was. Before Satan was, God was. By man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. Adam messed it up, but Jesus Christ made it right. Adam ruined it for all of us, but Jesus Christ restored it for all of us. Adam got us into trouble, but Jesus Christ got us out of trouble. Adam ruined it for us, and Adam pushed us down the ditch, but Jesus Christ lifted us up out of the miry clay and set our feet upon a rock and established our goings. By man came also death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. And for some of our cult friends out there that profess to be Christians, it is a literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, touch me when he rose again from the dead. Behold my hands and my feet. He took food and he ate it. He had a literal flesh and bone body. Notice the order of resurrection, verses 20 and 23. Verse number 20, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. There's an order to this. Verse 23, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. You know, there are obviously some resurrections in the Old Testament. 
Elijah and Elisha took place, took part in some resurrections. You know that. You know, even during Christ's ministry, he raised some people from the dead, Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son. There are resurrections in the Bible. We understand that. But Jesus Christ gave the details in John chapter number 10 about his resurrection when he said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received from my Father. John 10, 17, and 18. So Jesus Christ is the only man to ever rise again from the dead by his own power. Titus chapter number 1, verse number 2, God promised eternal life before the world began. Jesus Christ knew that he had that promise of eternal life when he laid down his life on Calvary's cross. He took it up again. So we have Christ first. He's got to come up first. The Bible says he's the firstborn among many brethren. So we see the order of resurrection here. There was this Methodist, and he had a kind of a little running joke between him and the local Baptist preacher, and they'd go back and forth, and he'd say, yeah, our church is better than your church, and we do this, and we do that. He was always comparing himself to the Baptist preacher, and there was a couple other preachers he did the same thing with. I always just boasting about how much better their Methodist church was than the other denominations and so forth. So the Baptists and the other fellows, they got together and said, look, we're going to play a trick on him. Next time we're out eating coffee, out, out uh, having some coffee, we're going we're gonna to get him. So they did. When he was up to the restroom, they took a little sleeping tablet and they put it into his coffee. So he obviously drank his coffee and he went on to the office and he fell into a deep sleep. Well, his friends, they had... Uh, they were in good with the funeral home, so they had got them a used, or a, not a used, but a, uh, a, a coffin uh, that was unused. And they went to the cemetery. He had, their friend had fallen asleep, so they put him in the car. They drug him. They, they drug him out there. They drugged him twice, right? And they put him in this coffin next to a uh, freshly dug grave. And they put all these fresh flowers around it. Of course, they... They uh, left it open, just kind of hiding in the bushes to see when he was going to wake up. And he started stirring a little bit, and probably the allergies from all those flowers getting up his nose. And he woke up. He woke up. He looked around. He saw. He got up out of the out of the coffin. He saw all that dirt from the grave there. Then he started shouting, "Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! I knew it was right. I knew us Methodists were going to come up before you Baptists." <laughs> you know, uh, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. I know from that verse that Baptists are going up in the rapture first because the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen and amen. Sometimes Baptists can be the dead, dehydrated Baptists, as the old Harold Seitler, the old preacher, used to say. Dead, dehydrated Baptists. You need to lighten up a little bit. You need to realize there is a life worth living. We shouldn't just always be focused on the sorrow of this world. I know Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I understand there is suffering in the world. But you got to get your eyes on him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Verses 24 to 28. There will be an overcoming because of resurrection. I like verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, I believe, it says there shall be no more curse. Death will be gone. He's the resurrection and the life. How can this happen? All of this can happen because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead first. He set in motion this amazing truth of resurrection. Next we have the power of of resurrection. Verses 35 through 50, we won't read the entire verse, but notice in verse 35 he begins with man's questions. But some will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do thou they come? Notice how Paul answers these people very politely. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. He calls them fools. And let me just say this, we are foolish when we question the providence and the promises of Almighty God. We're foolish. We're being skeptics. We're doubting. We're focusing on the sorrow instead of rejoicing in the hope that is set before us. 
looking for that blessed open the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Instead, what we do is we begin to question how in the world, especially when you have circumstances where someone may have perished in a fire or someone may have been cremated or someone may have been buried at sea or strange circumstances maybe someone was an organ donor and they donated their kidneys or they donated their lungs or they donated their heart or something you say in the mind how in the world can God raise that person from the dead when that person is not in existence anymore of course, the more we begin to study the natural world that God has given us, the more we see and understand that there is more to God's creation than what we can see with the human eye, with the naked eye. Those molecules and atoms and those parts and those pieces are still in existence. One of the laws of thermodynamics teaches us that nothing can be created or destroyed. So in the resurrection, God knows exactly how and exactly where those molecules and those pieces are. And he can pull those things together. Now what Paul does here is he brings up a question. They say, how can this happen? How are the dead raised up? What body do they come? And so he begins to question these things and he uses the analogy of a seed being sown in the ground. And the old timers, and I say that respectively, they used to say, um, we're planning so and so today. And they will be referring to the internment. They will be referring to the burial. We're going to go out there and we're going to plant them in the, in the field. And they meant that we're going to put them in the ground because we're planting them. That means they're going to come up one day. When you take that little seed and you go and you sow it in the, into the ground, you plant it into the ground, you plant it expecting it to come up. And so when a Christian dies, you die expecting that body to come up one day. Now, National Geographic, they found a date palm going back to the time of Christ, around 2,000 years old. They took that date palm seed. I say date palm, I mean seed. They took that 2,000-year-old seed and they planted it and it sprouted and it grew. And then after 10 years, it actually began to put out fruit. In other words, it began to put out blooms. Now, it hasn't reproduced yet as of the date that I read the article. But the fact is, a seed that old. They've even found older seeds that they've dated with their carbon dating methods that go way, way, way back and they have planted and they have sprouted. That's an amazing thing because you can take the molecules that make up some of these seeds and you can try to manufacture your own seed and you can't get any results. You have to take the seed that God made and God created man and whenever a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, there's a new seed that comes in, the seed of the Word of God. The Bible tells us we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so that word of God, it makes a new life. And when you put that body in the ground, because that person was saved, one day they're going to sprout and they're going to come up. Notice the contrast here in verses 42 through 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So we have a contrast here. You'll notice in verse number 45, he mentions Adam being a living soul. You'll also notice in verse number 44, you'll see a natural body given. And then you'll also notice in verse 45, he mentions a quickening spirit. We have three things in the passage. We have a soul mentioned, we have a body mentioned, and we have a spirit mentioned. In Genesis chapter number 2, the Bible says the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So God made his body out of the ground. But then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. 
And then man became a living soul. God gave you a body so you could be conscious of the world around you. God gave you a soul so you could be conscious of yourself. That's why animals in the scripture, especially the Old Testament, are said to have souls. It's not that animals, you know, you got your little, uh, little meow meow Garfield or whatever, and he's up in heaven waiting for you one day. Your little cat's up there waiting for you. Your canary's up there waiting for you one day. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the animals are conscious of themselves as living things. A tomato plant is not conscious of itself. It's just there, but it's alive, but it's not living in the sense of being a soul. He gave you a soul so you could be conscious of you. You are not just DNA and RNA. You're not just running around dancing to the, the tunes of the DNA molecule. You are not here by accident. You are here by design. And he made you a living soul. So you have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. When a person gets saved, the Bible says you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. That spirit that's been out of fellowship with God, that spirit that's been running from God, that spirit that's dead to spiritual things is given life. It says we are risen with Christ, Colossians chapter number 3, Romans chapter number 6. And so you have new life. Now you have resurrection life. And so you'll notice he develops this contrast here with the body. It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. So, well, you know, I think I'm pretty good. I think I look good. I'm in shape and I'm, I'm working out every day. Your body, if it's left to itself and you don't give it the attention you should give it, it will stink and it will rot and it will eventually die. Don't feed it for two or three weeks. Don't put any water in your body for four or five days. Don't take a bath for a week and see how glorious your body smells. Please don't take that advice. When we do get to come back together for church, please, let's all make sure we are bathed and well-groomed and well clean. Some of you guys probably staying home from work or working from home, you probably have a beard that drags the ground. You know, clean up a little bit. Amen. Now, the contrast, the corruption. You know, we can talk about moral corruption, and that is evidently true, but I believe it also is reflected in our actual physical lives. The body is corruptible. You say, well, it has these natural abilities and natural properties. You cut it, it begins to scab over, and it begins to heal. Yeah, but there's a lot the body can't do, and the body is headed for a hole in the ground. It's corruption. It's raised in incorruption. There's a glorified body. When that body rises again from the dead, it will not experience any type of corruption. It won't experience sin, and thank God for that. But there's no type of corruption. That means it can't die. As a Christian in the church age, you're going to get a glorified body just like Christ. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 tell us that we'll have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. The Bible says in 1 John chapter number 3, we'll see him as he is. We will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to have a body like Christ. That means it won't die. We won't have to try to eat of the tree of life for eternity in order to sustain physical life. We have eternal life. It's in corruption. It's sown in corruption. You put the body in the ground, it's dead, it's rotting, but it's raised in incorruption. Notice the contrast again. Verse number 43, it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. The dishonor oftentimes that you see when someone gets toward the end of their life. Someone that may have been very dignified and very polite and very careful with how they handled themselves, someone that may have been very self-sufficient, someone in their life who have been very particular of how they handled themselves and well-groomed and well-dressed and well-behaved, you'll see them toward the end of their life dependent on someone to come in and change their diaper and wash them up and cut their hair, cut their fingernails, feed them, take care of them. Help them to stand up. A man that might have been a bodybuilder 
or might have been a wrestler or might have been just a strong man who could work hard for 14, 15 hours a day. You'll see him in his frailty, all bent over, all crutched over, going back into that fetal position, just bones wrapped and encased in leathery skin. So dishonorable, so sad. Someone that might have had a mind of a genius, sharp as a tack able to quote things and talk about issues and present logical cases. Maybe someone that was in a position of leadership that led people, that taught people, that instructed people. Maybe toward the end of their life they begin to lose their mind. It's not just a matter of not being able to find their car keys. Now they can't remember their wife's name. That's so dishonorable. It's sad. It's sown in dishonor. But thank God that's not the rest of the verse. It's raised in glory. I often think of some of the mentally handicapped people that you meet. The Bible says sin is not imputed when there is no law. Where the knowledge of transgression is, that's where Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. There's a period where you have someone that has a mental handicap and they can't comprehend and understand the knowledge of good and evil. They're not held accountable for not being saved. Now many of those people do believe on Christ and they understand enough and they say that they trust Christ as their Savior. Some of them, they just don't have that ability. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. I often think of a young girl that we had in our youth group years and years ago. You've heard me talk about her. And she was just not all there. I mean, she was not severely mentally handicapped. She was able to, to function and go to school, but she was in the slow classes and so forth. And she would often have very remedial questions, and she didn't understand a lot of things, but she did get saved. I often think that one day we're going to be up in heaven and I'm going to see this person come to me in her glorified body, dignified body, honorable body, glorified, righteous body with perfect clarity of mind to be able to come up and have a conversation and praise the Lord and point to Jesus and say, there he is. He's the reason I'm here. Man, what a blessing that's going to be. Sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. Notice verse number 43, sown in weakness, it's raised in power. The weakness and frailty of life. Just the moment you think you have it all figured out, and the moment you think you have your life going just like you want it to go, something will happen. And I'm telling you, God has got a wrench to fit all the monkeys in the world and you'll go through life and you will have to come face to face with this problem and the problem is you are not strong enough. The Bible says there's no man that hath power over death. No man, hath, no man have, can have, there is no discharge in that war, he says in Ecclesiastes. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You can't say, oh, I'm going to hold on just a little bit longer. I refuse to die. Oh, you're going to die. It's sown in weakness. The sooner you admit your weakness, like the Apostle Paul when he said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. Like the Apostle Paul who asked God three times to take the thorn, and when God said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, my grace is sufficient, Paul finally said, okay, I'll take your grace, and I will glory in my tribulations. I'll glory in my weakness, because I know that when I'm in my weakest point, God can do his strongest work through me. When I'm weak, then am I strong. God's not interested in our talents. He's not interested in our abilities. He's not interested in how strong and how great we are. We ought to be interested in how great He is. The sown in weakness is raised in power. Romans chapter 8 verse number 11 says, If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He shall quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
The same power that took a dead man, Jesus Christ, who was beat with a cat of nine tails, that took a dead man, Jesus Christ, whose beard was plucked out, who took a dead man, Jesus Christ, who had a crown of thorns slammed down on his head, who took a man, Jesus Christ, who was crucified, who hung on a cross, who after he died, a spear went up in his side. That same power that raised him from the dead is inside of you if you're saved. The power of God. The Lord knoweth those that are his. And all those little seeds that are planted all across this world from all the ages all the way back to the crucifixion of Christ, those that are saved, he knows where they are. And when that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ are going to rise for first. That power will be exhibited for the whole world to see. Charles Wesley's hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, the final verse says this, Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. Made like Him, like Him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Didn't Jesus say something like, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also? Why so much gloom over the tomb? Why so much sorrow and why so much suffering because of the sorrow? Lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. God's final answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The worst thing for man is death and God solved that problem. Adam messed it up in the Garden of Eden and Jesus Christ fixed it starting in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will but thine be done. And he went on to the cross and he accomplished eternal redemption for us. And God's answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now notice the prophecies about the resurrection. Verses 49 through 57. He says, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Of this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophecy of the resurrection. First of all, notice verses four, verse 46. We lay down the earthy. The first thing that comes is that which is natural, that which is of the earth. You have an old man before you have a new man. The new man is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But that old man comes first. You know what the Lord's going to do one day? He's going to let you lay down and rest. He's going to let you lay down that earthy. Now, I hope the rapture happens and we don't have to die. It wouldn't disappoint me at all if I don't even get to finish this message if, boom, next time I see you, we're at the, the judgment seat of Christ. We're up there at the, at the uh, rapture. wouldn't bother me a bit. But if he tarries, you know what's going to happen? You're going to lay down this earthy. The old man is going to lay down. The natural man's going to lay down so the new man can get up. There's a great principle in that. We should be practicing that on a daily basis. We need to be laying down the old man so we can take up the new man. We need to put off the old man so we can put on the new man. We need to quit sinning so we can start serving. And that's the principle of the glorified life or the victorious Christian life is put off the earthy so you can take up the heavenly. We need to be heavenly minded. Now, we have to lay down the earthy. You've got to put it off. And the thing that we oftentimes dread or we have questions and we say, well, no one's ever come back before. Jesus Christ came back. 
Before that, there's even other resurrections. But Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He came back. We didn't read all the verses, but he came back for 40 days. He, and he appeared to 500 brethren, the Bible tells us. The resurrection is a historical fact. My religion, if you will, or my faith system is not just built on philosophy or some kind of religious pipe dream. My faith is built and, and established on fact. Historical fact. Go to Mecca, you can find uh, Mohammed's uh, bones. Go to uh, Jerusalem, go to uh, Israel, you can't find Jesus Christ's bones. He rose again from the dead. The resurrection is a fact that I've put my faith in. That's why the Bible says, if you believe on Christ, in Romans chapter number 10, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. There's no faith in Jesus Christ without belief in his resurrection. Because your problem is death and hell. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from death and from hell. And if you don't believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that means he has no power over death or hell. But we know the rest of the story. He rose again from the dead and he told John, I have the keys of hell and death. That's why the psalmist could say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Death's door is not an evil or horrendous or scary place for the Christian. It's just the door to cross over to the other side. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said in the book of Philippians, he said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, it's needful to abide with you. In other words, he says, I really want to go ahead and go on and be with the Lord. He had a longing for heaven. Do you have a longing for heaven? Or, or are you so tied into things down here that you just want to hang on to stuff down here? Or are you so upset about the current situation because your life has been so pulled into uh, and, and unraveled, you don't get to do the fun things you used to do anymore? Or, or things have, are you so rooted down here you can't get planted up there? As believers in Christ, we are to be anticipating seeing our Lord. So death is not something to be afraid of. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We lay down the earthy to take up the heavenly. Notice we bore the image of the earthy, verse 49. That's Adam's image. When he had Seth, the Bible says he had a son in his own image and his own likeness. And Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is the image of God. When you receive Christ, you get the image of God. Now you have that three-part body, soul, spirit finally restored. Now your spirit, which was dead, is now made alive. And now you have the image of God, which is Jesus Christ. The thing that was ruined is finally restored when you get saved. And so now we can lay off the earthly, we can put off the earthly image to take up the heavenly image, which is Christ. There were three guys and they were, three buddies, they were discussing uh, what they would like to be said at their funeral if they were to die. And one guy, you know, he he said, well, you know, I, I think I would like for people to say how much that I cared about the community, how much of a humanitarian that I was, and so forth. The other guy said, no, nah, man, that ain't, that ain't it for me. I'd like people to stand up and tell people how great of a, of a father I was and a family man, how good of a husband I was to my, fam my wife and, and how good of a father I was to my kids. And the other guy said, man, y'all are missing it. Man, if, if, if I died and I'm laying there, I'd want somebody to say, hey, man, look, his leg's moving. He ain't dead. Friend, when you die, people say, well, I died and came back. And, you know, people get all into these life after death stories. You have to be real careful with that stuff. Oftentimes when you read these accounts, they don't line up with what the Bible says about heaven. So if it doesn't line up, I even read an account of a pastor. And his account didn't match what I read in the book of Revelation about heaven. So I'm just going to have to say, well, that guy's not right because I believe the Bible is the final authority. You have to be real careful with those things because they're so suspect. When God wants you dead, you're going to be dead. And if he says it's over, it's over. I gave you the verse earlier from Ecclesiastes. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in that war. 
It's appointed unto men once to die. We lay off the image of the earthly to take up the image of the heavenly. And boy, this is a mystery because he reveals something that's going to take place. And it's just for the body of Christ in the church age. The body of Christ, those that have already went on to heaven, that's the dead in Christ. When you get saved, you get put into the, the collective body of believers, which we call the body of Christ. That's what the Bible calls it, the church, which is his body. There's a local assembly, which we are not really able to meet locally right now, but there's a local assembly of believers in the Bible. It's called a church. But then there is the spiritual church, which is his body, and that's the collective corporate group of all believers in Jesus Christ. And those that have already died and went on to heaven, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring them with him, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so their soul is already with God. To depart and be with Christ is far better. The body's still in the ground, or wherever those molecules may be. But their soul is with God. They're safe with him. But when he returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. And this is called a mystery because what we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians 15 also reveals not just a resurrection, but it reveals a rapture. He says, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. Some people are going to be alive when the Lord comes. Remember back when we talked about the order of the resurrection? It's Christ the first fruits, then those that are Christ at his coming. So Jesus Christ is going to come back, and when he comes back and the rapture takes place, if you're saved and you're alive at the time of the rapture, the dead in Christ are going to come up, and then we are going to be changed from mortal bodies to immortal bodies. The dead are going to be changed from corruptible bodies to incorruptible bodies. And then he says in verse number 54, death will be swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? You know, for a Christian, death is bittersweet. It's bitter, and I'm not going to say you shouldn't sorrow. And please, don't misunderstand me. I don't think, I think something will be wrong with you if you were laughing at one of your loved one's funerals, if you were all rejoicing and all this. You're just a little bit touched because even Jesus Christ wept when Mary came weeping at Lazarus' tomb. He says we shouldn't sorrow as others which have no hope. That doesn't mean you do not sorrow. Jesus is said to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It hurts to lose a loved one. It hurts deep. It's not something you just shake off and get over. It's something you have to work through. And God will give you grace to heal. And it will take time. And it will take the Holy Spirit ministering the scriptures that you already know, and maybe you don't know some of those verses, but you have to learn those so they can become your foundation. They can become your anchor. You can fall back on them when Satan gets in your head and you begin to question and you begin to doubt and you become skeptical. The Bible can bring that surety and that final answer that for the believer, everything's okay. Everything is okay and it's going to be okay. The end of the chapter, we have the push of the resurrection. Paul gives a therefore. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because of everything he said in 1 Corinthians 15, all of this resurrection power, God's final answer. Here's how it all lays out. If you're saved and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Romans chapter number 8. You're saved. You're going to be safe when you die. The Bible teaches eternal salvation and teaches assurance for your salvation. These things have are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. It's not a thing where you hope so and maybe I really believed when I believed and maybe, you know, I didn't sin too much and, oh, I didn't confess all my sins. You're never going to confess all your sins. There are some things you're doing right now you probably don't realize are wrong and you're going to find out when you stand in front of the Lord you messed up. Christ has died for all of your sins and if you've trusted Him as your personal Savior, His atonement's been made for you. His blood has covered your sins. You're safe. And His final word is, I'm going to pull you up out of that grave. 
death has no hold on the Christian. No hold at all. The power that's inside of you is an exceeding mighty power. And so we should rest in his final word. How do I know that Christ has risen? What proof have I to give? He touched my life one blessed day and I began to live. How do I know he left the tomb that morning long ago? I met him just this morning and my heart is still aglow. How do I know that endless life he gained for me that day? His life within is proof enough of immortality. How do I know that Christ still lives rich blessings to impart? He walks with me along the way and lives within my heart. Jesus Christ is alive and his final word to you is live. When Ezekiel saw that vision of dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 28, the Lord asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, thou knowest. He says, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy and say, live. Cause breath to come into you and live. If you're one of God's children, the Bible talks about being heirs and joint heirs together with Christ. If you suffer, he says, you'll be glorified together. Romans chapter 8. And he goes on to describe the adoption of our bodies, which has to do with the rapture and the resurrection. And if you're an heir of God, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that's what we're waiting for. There was a wealthy man who died. And at his hearing where they read the will and distributed everything, the lawyer sat down around the table with all of the family and friends and went through the prerequisites of order. And he read the will. To such and such I leave, such and such, all the way down through. And at the end of the thing... He asked if anyone had any questions or comments. And there was a young man that said, Hey, uh, I just wanted to see if there's anything in there for me. You know, I was practically like a son. And I'm sure that he would have left me something, you know. I mean, I mean, even several times he told me that I was like a son to him. And he says, Well, truth be told, he mentioned you when he was drawing up the papers for this. And he told me about you. And he said that he had offered to adopt you as his own son on many occasions and you refused. And as you notice in the will, everything that's left is left to his heirs and you did not take him up on his offer. Therefore, you're not an heir. You can know all about the love of God. You can know all about the resurrection, the promise of eternal life and the joy And the peace that God gives, even in the face of death, you can know all about it, but not experience it. If you've never taken God up on His offer to become a child of God, why don't you do that today? This will be a great time for you personally to become a believer. You say, well, I believe. Yeah, you might just believe in your head, but have you trusted Christ It's one thing to believe a certain doctor is a good surgeon. It's another thing to say, okay, I'm going to sign the paper and you can put me out and I'll let you operate on me. Do you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Why don't you receive His gift of salvation? This would be a great Sunday to do this on. So how do I do it? Well, I gave you the verse earlier, Romans chapter 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Can you admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Can you admit that without Jesus Christ saving you, death would be the end of anything good for you and the beginning of everything bad? If you die as a sinner instead of a saint. If you die as a sinner instead of being saved, you are going to go to a place the Bible describes and calls hell fire to pay for your own sins. And you don't have to pay for your sins. Jesus already paid for your sins. But you have to receive His gift of salvation. If you turn down someone's gift, they can't force it on you. And God can't force 
and he won't force his gift of eternal life. But he offers it just like the man offered the guy in the story that I mentioned to be his son, and he refused. There is no hope of eternal life if you refuse the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ offers. Why don't you receive him? The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So how do I do it? Just pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I don't want to go to hell when I die. But I believe the gospel. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins in my place. And I believe that he rose again from the dead. And by faith, I'm asking you to save me and let me know that I'm saved. I'm trusting you the best way I know how. Thank you for saving me. Can you pray a real simple prayer like that? If you prayed that prayer, why don't you let us know? We'd like to send you some literature, send you some gospel tracts, some literature for new Christians. And if you're a Christian that's been maybe afraid of death and maybe looking at the dark, luminous clouds of sin and suffering and sickness, I want to encourage you. God has an answer for that. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.